I'm Jackie Dawson. I work at the University of Ottawa in Canada, and I work on the human and social and political uh, dimensions of climate change, mostly in the Canadian Arctic. So I, I focus on the human and policy dimensions of climate change uh, in the Arctic. So right now we're doing a lot of work on Arctic shipping and um, so what, what's going on with climate change, it's, it's changing sea ice conditions which is opening up the Arctic for, uh, for shipping uh, and tourism. So we do a lot of work on, on the fact that there's, there's a 400% increase in pleasure craft in the Canadian Arctic uh, since between 2005 and now. Uh, so it's, there's a lot to be done in terms of regulation, policy, how do we deal with this situation, what are the impacts on local people, uh, good and bad. So we're looking at opportunities and risks associated with, the, the, with climate change in the Canadian Arctic. Climate change isn't always such a bad thing, but, it, but, but then you have to think about what are the secondary impacts. Of, so what are, it is good, we're bring, there's economic development potential for sure. Uh, you know, where there's more resource development, there's access to resources that weren't there before. Um, we can, um, you, uh, well, there's new shipping routes, uh, but then are our local communities really ready for, for, uh, for a lot more tourism? Um, we're talking about small, small uh, hamlets of, you know, 250 to 1,200 people. Uh, that it, 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 we don't have the infrastructure necessarily to support this, so there are a lot of opportunities, but there are a lot of risks that we need to mitigate to make sure that those opportunities are, are opportunities still. I would imagine there would, there would be a great desire among people to see the Arctic, given that sense that it's not going to be around forever. Yeah, so there's this phenomenon right now called last chance tourism, uh, which is where people are going to places that they think they're not going to be able to see in the future. So the Arctic is a, is a huge draw for that. So people think there's going to be no more glaciers or uh, polar bears are, 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 are dwindling, they're drowning, and all these sort of perceptions that may or may not be true are drawing people to the north to, to experience the north before it is gone, um, which may or may not be accurate but it is influencing an, an increase in demand in tourism in polar regions. Yeah there's a market, there's a market for this and actually the Great Barrier Reef is another place where last chance tourism is, is being experienced. People want to go and see the reef before the, the coral is bleached beyond uh, what is authentic, the idea of authentic. Mostly, most of the work we're doing right now is in the Arctic but we are doing some work in the Caribbean. Uh, and so w we recently looked at uh, a case study where we're trying to determine what are the factors that a community needs to enhance their adaptive capacity to climate change. So one way you can do this is you can look at communities that have successfully implemented some sort of adaptation strategy. So in Paget Farm in the, in, in the Grenadines in um, the Caribbean region, they've, imp they've uh, through funds from climate, clim from climate change adaptation funds, through, through Jeff and uh, et cetera, they've implemented a desalinization plant there. So what we did is we went there and we, we looked at that plant and we tried to figure out, okay, well this is, this is an example of a community that was successful. They now have fresh water where they didn't before uh, and they're expected to have less fresh water in the future. So we worked with that community and tried to determine, okay, what are the factors that made this community successful compared to this community which has not successfully been able to, to, to deal with or to adapt to, to some fairly significant impacts of climate change. And were the success uh, traits, were they scalable or applicable to different? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you always have to be a bit cautious, but I think we can uh, look at certain certain determinants of adaptive capacity. Um, some of them are fairly obvious, like access to financial capital, uh, human capacity, uh, but some of the more maybe less obvious ones are having uh, single champions that uh, have the ability to link to all the different scales of policy. So you need somebody who's well connected within international political circles, national circles, regional circles, and local circles, and not not every region has that and we found that having that one person who can speak the language of all of those different sort of scales it was really important to, to, to the success of this community. This person was, was very charismatic, very, you know, a real leader that had um, buy-in from the community and buy-in from the international funding agency. So it's, 
you know, so, uh, so that seemed to be an important piece. And then cross-scale cross communication between all those different levels and throughout the duration of the project. There's so much science going on uh, that's useful and important, but if you aren't able to translate that into action, or if you aren't able to explain that to local people or decision makers, then it's almost it's it's kind of useless. You know, I hate I hate to see really amazing research get put into journal articles and then just circulated among all of us academics where we're just reading each other's work and 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 you know it doesn't you know and then we wonder why it's not having any impact. It's because there's actually a, there's actually a really important piece in between where you have to work with communities to to make things happen. So the way we do our the way we do our research is I don't, um, I never just think to myself, oh, this would be a great project. Uh, our approach to research involves going to communities, local communities across the, the Arctic or the Caribbean or wherever, or going to government agencies or going to industry partners and saying, what are your major issues right now? What are the impacts that you're experiencing from climate change? Uh, and what should we be studying? What are the questions that we need to answer? And what do you need? What would help you to, to solve the issues that, you, that you're dealing with? So we're always working with issues, what are the risks, what are the opportunities, and what are the solutions? And, and, and they're not coming from me. They're always coming from stakeholders. What have you found are some of the ways that local Arctic communities are being impacted? Well, there's direct impacts of climate change on local communities. So things like change dis changing distribution of wildlife, which is um, really important culturally. There's still subsistence uh, culture in the Canadian Arctic, well in the Arctic proper. Uh, and so that, that changing wildlife patterns is really, really impacting their cultural traditions, their ability to transmit knowledge between generations, their ability to read the land and read the ice. So we're seeing increased accidents, increased rates of drownings and things because uh, traditional knowledge is changing so because the because the ice is changing so you can't read it as well as you could in the past so there's those direct impacts but then there's the indirect impacts so the social and economic sort of uh, manifestations of what's happening in the biophysical environment so climate change is changing the natural environment which is um, increasing economic development opportunities so there's uh, so there's impacts like there's increased resource development that's directly related to climate change. So now you've got these secondary impacts. And uh, even though there might be job opportunities, they're not necessarily going to local people. Uh, so there's, you know, there's, there's, there's primary impacts and there's secondary impacts. Essentially, I can't help them adapt. They have to, they have to tell they have to decide what's best for them. But what I do is I, I try to gather as much information as I possibly can and, and give them a, a, a suite of potential options that for them to decide and implement based on what's going to work best for them. The thing that I think that we do best is we link natural scientists with social scientists and we come together and then we, we take all this information and we put it into a, a sort of policy realm so we try to translate it into real world possibilities. So one of the things, I'll just give you an example of one of the things that we did a couple of years ago. Um, the communities in the Canadian Arctic right now are quite concerned about the number of cruise ships that are, that are coming through the Northwest Passage. So, and one of the concerns among many was that people coming off those cruise ships didn't necessarily understand how to act in the communities, um, what's culturally appropriate, what's not. So what we did with the one particular community, Pond Inlet, in the northern tip of Baffin Island, was we worked with the community and we created a, a code of conduct for visitors coming to the community. So when they come off, so when they get on the cruise ship, they get a brochure uh, that, that sort of has a, a list of things that you might uh, want to know. Uh, and something that was really important to, to the local uh, community was to that we would write these kind of rules of conduct in a very welcoming way. So it's not your typical do not step on the flowers or leave only footprints, take only pictures or uh, things like that. It's, it's we welcome you to our community and while you're here we ask that you ask uh, the parents of our children if you want to take photos of them or things. So it's very welcoming and they wanted that tone set. So we helped uh, write and produce that and now that's uh, 
distributed on cruise ships, all cruise ships that are coming through the Canadian Arctic. And there's Inuktitut, you can learn Inuktitut phrases, which is the local dialect. And we find we're often writing multiple reports of the same, the same uh, material, because you ha we're writing policy briefs to, to government. Uh, with the same outcomes and material, we're writing community reports to communities. Uh, and then we're writing academic journal articles. So you do, you have to change the way that you uh, pitch your ideas. And the code of conduct for the tourists is an example of that. Very simple language, very inviting language, uh, because they want, yeah, they, the, 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 co the local culture is very sharing oriented. It's very inviting. Uh, so they want that tone set. Uh, and then when you write something, uh, a policy brief to try to, influence government to change a certain regulation or policy or make a suggestion, uh, the language you need to use is, is, is succinct. It needs to be succinct and clear and punchy and you need to get to the point in the first two sentences, the first sentence. Uh, so yeah, there is a, there's a, there's a big difference and you, ha you do have to, I find the best way to, to, to do this is to work as a team. And I, I think that's the only way to do it. We have to work together with glaciologists, with, with permafrost experts, with um, climatologists and paleoclimatologists and communication experts and social scientists and all of these different peoples. And on top of that, we need to be working with government, with communities, with industry. There's no other way to solve a problem that is as big as, as climate change. Early, early on when we started doing some research on uh, the impact of cruise ships, uh, the increasing number of cruise ships in the Canadian Arctic. We organized a workshop um, and we brought together all the stakeholders that we could bring together and we went in and unconsciously uh, went in uh, to this workshop not really realizing that uh, how much knowledge was already in the room and not really realizing where they were in their dealing with the issue of climate change and, and tourism and and so the the workshop did not go well and there was a lot of conflict and irritation and um, something a simple comment was was regularly mis miscommunicated and misunderstood because there was a tension there because we we didn't take enough time we didn't take the time we needed to to understand who was in the room and you have to do that uh, and we learned from that and we never I mean this was over a decade ago we learned from that and now we work regularly with these people and they're a, an invaluable resource so you have to um, you have to know you, you have to understand the amount of knowledge that it, that it already exists uh, even though we didn't go in thinking that we knew more uh, but we did go in not understanding uh, who we had invited to the table. Mm -hmm. We also didn't understand that there was already conflict between di different groups that we had brought to the table. So for years afterwards we had in meetings individually with those groups. But I can say ten years later we, n we are now able to work all of us together uh, and, and, and we've actually written papers together, we've contributed to, to, to um, policies that have gone through the, the territorial uh, legisla legislature. So you do, you learn from these mistakes, you, but you got to be resilient. You just, you have to be, you have to, you have to learn and keep mm -hmm. going. Two groups that I guess kind of have cultural differences would be physical scientists and social scientists. Yes. What are the challenges <laughs> of getting these two um, groups working together? The, there are, yeah, there are, there are often challenges working Social sci with social scientists and natural scientists together and we're, we're, we are working out those bugs and we're getting much better at it than we were in the past. Um, some of the, our, our, our languages are different, our, our culture, our own culture of, of research is different and uh, I think one of the first things that, that is happening now is, is um, a culture of respect needs to be created and the only way to, to create that is to increase understanding of, of everybody's research um, you know and instead of a social scientist saying oh well they're too those natural scientists they're so linear in their thinking they are ignoring all the big pictures it's not realistic and then the the natural scientist saying oh those social scientists is airy fairy 
you know, not important. Uh, but the only way, the only way forward is for us to work together. So we, uh, we need to respect what we, what we do, understand that we can do something better together. And I think we're doing that. I mean, we, I work regularly with glaciologists, sea ice scientists, and we take their outputs and we translate it and we, and then we work with communities to create policy, to create, you know, and you have to, you have to, to do that. Mm -hmm. But then when you go to write your journal articles, you have to figure that out too. That's a challenge because even the, the way you, the way you create your dialogue is totally different between natural science and social science. In, in natural science, you're really reporting on a finding. In social science, you're creating a storyline around your findings. How did you come to be working in this area? What was your path? My path? was well, I'm a natural scientist. Well, sort of. I, I'm not. I did, <laughs> I did a natural science undergrad. So I have a, a, a Bachelor of, Na of Natural Science. So I was um, going down that path. And, but what I found what, really, what I was really passionate about was the applications of natural science. So then in grad school, I did a master's in a business uh, department that was fo focused more on tourism. So I went into social sciences. And then for my PhD, I did, a, a, I did my PhD in climate change. And, did some climate change modeling, but then took the, those model outputs and applied it in a social context. So I've always been really interested at being at that intersection, being that person who translates, you know, the natural science to the social science. So that was my, my path. And, and, and in terms of why I do research in, in Arctic shipping, well, I do research in the Arctic because I love the Arctic and I, I love it's, it, I love the landscape, I love the people, I love everything about it. I've always been drawn to the Arctic. But why do I do shipping or tourism research? Because the, the people, the residents in the community told me that's what's important right now, is, is the impact of, of shipping. Climate change is causing this, this increase in shipping, we need to deal with this. Well, we're causing it, so we better deal with it. Uh, any yeah, that. I mean, if you want it succinct, we uh, we have an obligation, and and we need to we need to live up to that. There's no there's no other path. There's no other answer. Because I did all this climate modeling and you just, like honestly, you just, I was like, okay, manipulate the model, change the inputs, <laughs> run, <laughs> run, you know, it's like, and now you're working, now I'm working with government and I'm trying to influence policy and I'm trying to make sure that local people's voices are heard in, in the policies that we create, or that, not that I create, but the mm -hmm. government creates and it's way more complex.